Welcome to the 320 Podcast, where we encourage you to reach for the immeasurably more life with Christ. From discussions on scripture, to poetic messages, to dreaming big with Jesus, you will enjoy a variety of episodes brought to you by Shelley Wilson Ministries. To find out more about Shelley Wilson Ministries and the many resources available to you, please visit our website at www.shellywilsonministries.org. Hey, you guys, it's Shelly. Welcome to this week's 320 podcast. Um, well, I was going to do something a little different. Uh, I had recorded it yesterday, but I'm going to bag that for now because we had something come up in group last night that I just feel like I, I feel like the Lord circled back, circled back with me on it. And I actually didn't sleep very well last night over it. So I feel like it's the conviction of the Lord. So I want to come sharp in this a little bit. Um, I'll make sure I send this particular podcast to each one who was in our group last night, but this should encourage everyone, um, even if you weren't in our support group last night. Um, oh, so let's talk about prayer. Um, let's, let's talk about um, drawing near to God. Um, so the, the thing, the, there kind of was a common theme last night about the struggle that is very real of staying in the word, of staying in prayer, of finding time to carve out for that with the Lord. Um, we talked about different seasons of life. Uh, we talked about the truth of that, you know, if, if you and I never open the Bible again, it, do, it doesn't change the way God loves us, right? But it does change the way we grow in him, okay? And I think that's kind of what I need to come back around to because I, I almost feel like I want to be careful. I want to be careful that I don't let you live in a place less than what God is calling you to. And listen, we all have certain circumstances in life that make it, even harder for some than others to steal a, a quiet time away with the Lord, right? Um, we talked about how in seasons of grief, we shared one of the lady's stories. You know, she was so um, dogmatic because of the theology in her background. If she prayed more, if she read the Bible more, if she went to more Bible studies, right? If she did everything right, then... God would answer. Then God would love her. Then God would do something for her. Then he would hear her. You see what I'm saying? So God God had to take her through a season where there was a lot of grief. And in grief, sometimes you actually can't sit still. I went through this with PTSD. You have a hard time, your eyes focusing on reading. Um, and so she went through that season, and I would have to remind her to have grace with herself that God knows the season she's in. Sometimes that happens after we go through a traumatic season of maybe loss, not just of, uh, but divorce, right? When, when something has come into our world that has just kind of undercut our, our footing, and, and we are trying to uh, come up for air if we feel like we're drowning you know, and all of that. And, and one of the things we talked about last night was God is always right there. It's never been about if you do more, you will earn his love, or if you do more, you'll earn his listening ear. He's always inclining his ear to hear you. He's always there. He always loves you the same on your good days when you seem to be doing everything right and on your bad days when you do nothing right. Nothing you do on either side of that scale changes his love. His love is unchanging for you. If you chose to walk away from God today and worship some some dead false idol or even Satan himself, which is all the same really at the end of the day, God's love for you still doesn't change. That's the beauty of God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's why he sent his son Jesus to come die on the cross for your and my sin and to redeem us back to the Father, right? Because of God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 
God so loved the world, right? He loves the worst sinner. He loves the murderer. He loves the pedophile. He loves the traffickers, you know. He loves all of these people. He doesn't love the sin. He doesn't love what they do, the choices they make, the harm they cause. But his love for them is unchanging. He went to a cross for the worst of humanity. That's just that's just who he is. He the Bible says God is love. So there's nothing you can do to earn more of his love. And there's nothing you can do to lose his love. But I do want to circle circle back around and talk to you about why it is important. Because I want to be careful that I don't allow you... Please, most of you guys who know me know how uh, I try to be so gentle... Uh, Jan and I both, uh, there are times it gets hard to heal, and there are times I need to pull you into a truth that is challenging, and that's probably what this is going to be today. So when you hear me today, I do not want you to hear any condemnation. That would be of the devil. There is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but what I do want to, I want you to hear is a sharpening and a call of God to come into a secret place with him. So maybe God would help me, Lord. Please reshape your thinking. And this is this is what I was thinking about um, last night. You can all you'll always make time for what's important to you. Let's so let's go into a real honest, reflective place before the Lord. Um, I am just like you. There are times when things grab my attention so fast in the days that I'm like, oh my gosh, I've not sat with the Lord or I've not opened the word or whatever we all go through those seasons but i still have to say i you and i can have as much of jesus as we want and the life with christ is a disciplined life and and here's what i mean by that if you go to college to get a degree then you have to get up you have to go to school you have to do your homework you have to pass the test right to get good at the at the topic you're studying in that particular class it it doesn't just come to you in one meeting it doesn't you know you can't sign up for a college class pay the tuition and never show up and learn right um another example would be this you have a job we have a job you when you have a job you know you have a job Maybe it's a nine to five job. You know you have to get up every day. You have to get ready, put your clothes on, put your makeup on, get the kids ready, get them to school, get them to daycare, and go to your job. If you don't go to your job, then what happens? There's no payday, right? There's no payday. So either you don't get paid for not going or you get fired and you no longer have a job, right? Well, God doesn't really fire us like that, but... There is a payday that we don't get when we don't put him in his rightful place. And so here's the thing. There is a real intentional thing that you have to prepare in advance for. It's kind of like I was talking to you guys last night. And I'll give you an example of my own life because, you know, that's all I've got is my own life in the scriptures. And I want to take you through some of the word and and show you why. You don't want to spend time with God, even in fasting, to get something from Him. We want to spend time with God because we are in love with Him, because the lover of our soul, because He has in all all by Himself everything we need. Nobody else, not our spouse, not our children, not our grandchildren, not our job, our our bosses, not... uh, people even here that we're helping you in the ministry, none of us have all the answers for you. The only one that has all of the answers for your dear life is Christ. So if we go to everywhere else and to everybody else, but not to Jesus, we still don't get what we need, right? And, and what we need is not always material things, new jobs, new houses, uh, physical healing. Sometimes we need heart changes, right? We need we need some things in our lives to change. I need to change some behaviors in my life. I need to create some character and integrity in my life. You know, I had written on something the other day. Maybe I'm a liar, and God needs to help 
me with that. I need to start being honest and being truthful. And so today I'm going to bring you into the Matthew 6, 6 passage that this is what it says. It's really talking in the whole chapter uh, 5 and 6 about uh the Pharisees and how they they uh, pray out loud all these fluffy prayers for everybody to hear right God's saying you don't have to do that but when you go um, in your secret place but when you when you pray go into your room and when you have shut your door pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly and when you pray do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do for they think that they will be heard for their many words. In other words, the the Pharisees are, are coming to God in some seemingly holy way, but they're just trying to make themselves look good. They're not really having an intimate relationship with the Lord. And have you ever known somebody that does that? They talk to be heard, not to listen. You know, somebody comes into a room and they they're not there to heal or they're not there to be delivered. They're not there to learn as a student. They're just really there to have the spotlight on them. And, and, and there were probably seasons of my life, especially early in ministry that that would have been me because I, I had not yet come into uh, a full understanding that, okay, God is completely relational my good works are nothing but filthy rags to him. He wants my attention more than he wants my works. Now, the Bible says he has good works stored up for us. So each one of you guys um, have good works that God has already pre-planned for you to accomplish on the earth. And it is his responsibility to lead you to those things. It is not necessarily your responsibility to make it happen. And when I was sharing with you guys last night that your primary responsibility is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added. But here's the thing. You are going to have to fight for your time with the Lord because the one thing the devil doesn't want to happen is that. Because see, when that doesn't happen, then we've removed the, the seek first the kingdom right? We've done everything for everybody else, taken everybody to their appointments. We've, you know, gotten dinner on the table. We've done what the spouse needs and all this, but we didn't have our time with the creator. And that is a dangerous place to be. So here, so I want to, I want to offer some practical suggestions because I think I, what I don't want to do is talk at you. I want to say, okay, let's think about these things. You need to prepare. Let me let me give you what I did in my house. Some of you have already heard this before, but I'm going to share it again. It, it, it's, it's good to share this again. When my daughter was young, I was not following the Lord. I took her to, we had a Wednesday night girls night where we drank plenty and uh, smoked our cigarettes and everything and partied it up. And of course, I took her there. She saw all of that. She was involved in all of that. She would write on my cigarette package, Mama, please quit smoking. And I would laugh you know, and think that was so funny. And I look back at that now, and I think it's tragic, right? That, that I wasn't listening. I was having more fun than listening to my daughter, right? It was, it was more about me and not about her. And so, um, so she didn't see, I didn't train her right in the ways of the Lord because I wasn't even in the ways of the Lord. I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing, right? But see, after 10 years, I have my son, uh, at four months, uh, when he's four months old, I have my emotional breakdown, which led me to Jesus, bless the Lord. And I began to involve him in my life with the Lord. And this is how it started. My son would cry because when when I would get booked with my best friend to go out and sing, we would be gone every other weekend. And one day, he was crying. He didn't want me to leave. He wanted me to stay home. And I had to sit down with him and say, listen, babe, I know that you want me to stay home, but Jesus has called me to go share him with others. And when I was asking the Lord what to do about it, the Lord told me to give him a job. So I went to my son. I said, I tell you what, every time God calls me to go out and sing somewhere, 
I want you to do your job, and this is your new job. You are to be my prayer warrior. So when, when Mama goes to sing for all of this people, I'm asking you to get in your closet with the Lord, and you pray for me, and you pray for Carrie, who is my best friend singing with me then, and you pray for all the women and the men that I'm ministering to that they would hear from Jesus. And after I gave him a job, he was only like six, okay? So he was little. He never cried again because, see, I involved him in kingdom work. When God spoke to me about making my real closet, my prayer closet, my secret place, which is was way before the War Room movie came out, I also made my son one in his closet. And I went to him, and this is for all you guys with little kids. Some of us are empty nesters now, so we don't have the struggles of little ones. But I did live through a season with a little one, so you can do it. And here's how you can do it. I made him a prayer closet, and I said, let's decorate your prayer closet any way you want to. And this is where you will begin to meet with Jesus, just like I meet with Jesus. Okay? He grabbed a canteen, and he, it was precious. He filled it with water, and he hung it in his closet. Then he goes, and he gets a bag, and he fills it with candy, <laughs> and he puts that in his closet. And then I had put in there a Bible, and, 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 you know, he wasn't even where he could read good yet, right? But it didn't matter, right? It didn't matter. I'm trying to create a discipline with him. Um, and uh, another little book, like a where he can write down what God's saying and all of those kind of things. One uh, one day he comes in. <gasps> mama, mama, mama! My light in the closet was already on. Which that that is impossible because we have the kind of lights that when you open the door they come on, and when you close the door they go go off. So the light couldn't have already been on in a natural sense. And, and he's running in there. I'm completely oblivious to what's going on. That the Holy Spirit is working. And he says, Mama, Mama, Jesus was already in my closet. The light was already on. He was already waiting on me. And I see him looking over my shoulder while he's talking to me. And I'm like, that's okay, Brady. And then he goes, (gasps) and he very quietly points over my shoulder and he goes, he's right there. And I knew immediately that Jesus was standing over my shoulder as my six-year-oldish son is telling me that he just had an encounter with Christ in his closet. And you see what happens is the faith of a child is so much easier, guys, than us. So with him, I was able to do what I didn't do with my daughter, right? So every night I would go in and I would put on the helmet of salvation with him. And we made this fun little game out of it. And I would, I would make sound effects. And I would say, okay, let's say our prayer. So we're going to put on the helmet of salvation. And we're going to buckle our belt of truth. We made all these little sound effects so that he wouldn't forget how, put, how to put on the armor of God before he went to sleep. Okay, so these are ways that I would include him as a young one to to understand the ways of God, to understand that we have a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of seeking God. Did it mean that he understood everything? No. Did it even mean that I understood everything? Absolutely not. But there were times that when my son was small, maybe he had a friend over and I would holler at him. Brady, I'm going into my closet. And he would go, okay, Mom. And I would hear one of his friends say, why is your mom going into a closet? And he he would cash. I would overhear him from the other room say, that's where she meets Jesus. And and that that is how you do it as a mom of young kids, right? It may not look exactly the the same. You don't need a big space in a closet. For me, I'm a little... Um, obsessive compulsive if I see dishes in the sink if I see laundry that needs folded in that season of life my office was at home I was officing out of my home and so God stuck me in a little closet and I would just shut the door and let everything in the world go away okay now if your kids are younger than that and you can't really shut a door and be away from them then there's a kitchen table 
There's a, there's a, maybe you need to make them a little space in the room where you go, this is your prayer closet. And you let them decorate it and you put, put a Bible for them, a place where they write. And then maybe you're sitting at the table and they're within, in your eyesight. You can see what they're doing and you're having your Bible time. Jesus can meet you there just as much and he can still meet baby boy or baby girl there just as much in that setting. Uh, but here's the thing, pre-plan what you want to do, just like you have to pre-plan your day to get up and go to work, right? You have to have to pre-plan if I have a doctor's appointment, then I have to do certain things to get out the door to get to my doctor's appointment. So what can you put in place today? And listen, you have to teach everybody around you that this is how I'm going to be operating. This is now going to become some, a part of my every day. So I need everybody to understand when I'm with the Lord, this is my time. Listen, wives. Listen, husbands. You need to train your spouse that Jesus is first. Because if I allow anybody and everybody... If I allow every text message to interrupt my time with the Lord, if I allow every phone call to interrupt my time with the Lord, if my husband comes in every day, you know, at that time wanting to talk to me, guess guess who hasn't gotten my first attention, right? And here's the thing. Here's the reality. Oftentimes we go about our day and we've left God waiting on us. Now, there was a season when my quiet time was at night before bed. Everybody was in bed. And that, that was my quiet time. There was actually a season when I was working when my quiet time was at lunch. I had a job, a, a very demanding job. I would travel around the country doing sales. And when I worked from home in a home office, I would shut everything down from 12 to 1. And that was when I did my Bible study, when I did my prayer time. Kids were at school. All of those kind of things, you know. So... So, th this is the reality of it will cost you something, okay? It may cost you, I don't know, some coffee time in the morning. It may cost you um, going to lunch with other people. But again, it's the sacrificial life of saying, you know what? If I don't, if I don't, if I don't sit with the Lord, then I'm, I'm not going to learn His ways, right? So, let me... Let me take you through a few scriptures that I had pulled up that I think I, I want you to get a right understanding of why we spend time with God and why it's not a works-based mentality that we can fall into, okay? Here's what the promises of God say. <clears throat> Proverbs eight seventeen. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. So what does that tell me? When I seek him, I will find him. What does that also tell me? If I don't seek him, I will not find him. Does that mean that he's not there always looking out for you and always fully in love with you? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that you will not find out some things about him that he wants you to know. Psalms 145.18 says this, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Okay? Anytime we call on Jesus, he comes a running. It's the way he is. It's who he is. His word says, I know my sheep and they hear my voice. You know, there's a passage in scripture in, in Matthew 7 where he's talking about you know, many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons? Um, all of these works-based things, right, that work. I could say it like this. Did I not stay in my Bible every day? Did I not stay? Did I I, maybe I taught Sunday school every day. Maybe I was a preacher in the pulpit. And the last part of that says, but I will say I never knew them. In other words, they did a lot of great things for God, but they never got to know him intimately right? You can study the word just like the Pharisees. They would know the scriptures way better than I know the scriptures. And they missed the one who wrote the book. 
That's why we're learning in our groups and our equip class how to exercise senses, how to learn how to live in the Spirit, because it's the Spirit of God that gives life. Right? It's the Spirit of God that gives life. Even though I open the Bible, I need the Spirit to give me revelation. Why do I know that? Because He is the one who reveals all truth. If I don't have the Holy Spirit in me to reveal all truth, then I'm going to misinterpret Scripture. Right? Sometimes I misinterpret Scripture based on circumstance, based on what churches have taught me, and all that. That's why I need the Holy Ghost, right? He's the best teacher. He, he, he is known to be the bringer of truth, the revealer of truth, the teacher, the counselor, and the helper. So he is always there for us. So we want to go to him. Why? Because he's our helper. He's the one who reveals all truth. He's our counselor. He's our guide. So if I go to anybody else, if everybody else gets my attention but him, then I have gotten no guidance, not the best kind. I may have not gotten any teaching. Even if you come here on a weekly basis, I'm always going to tell you, you have got to go get to know the Lord Jesus yourself. There is a certain way and a language he, spe he will speak to you in a language that you understand right? No one could ever convince me that I don't hear from God. Why? Because we have a history. There, there, I've been through, you know, 30 years by now with him. There are patterns he's developed in my walk with him. There are certain ways he gets me messages that I've learned, and you need to learn what that's like for you and him. It's kind of like learning things about your best friend. You know what their favorite color is. You know what food they like, what food they don't like, right? You know whether they're good with kids or not good with kids. You know whether they're, you know, all of these different, you know what makes their heart um, happy. You know what things they love to do, things they hate to do, all of those kind of things. Those are the kind of things. Why is it we spend all our time with other people learning that, learning that about our spouse, but we don't learn those things about the Lord. So see, it's not that there's a condemnation that, because yes, it is going to be a normal struggle. I can promise you. You will always have to fight for your time with the Lord because it is exactly what Jesus, I mean, exactly what the devil doesn't want to happen. Why? Because in the prayer closet is where I've gotten lots of direction for my life and ministry. In the prayer closet is when God has cleaned up my heart for some sin bents that I didn't even know I had, right? Right? In the prayer closet are the times that I pour out deep sadnesses in my that are deep in my heart that I've never told anybody about, but he knows they're there, and I need to come into a place where he can heal me. So that's why we gonna we want to go to the secret place. And then I do like this passage in Jeremiah 29. 13 through 14, which says this, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Listen, he wants to set the captives free. So many times, I'm a big believer, you guys know I am. We believe in counseling here. We believe in medical doctors here. We believe in a lot of helpers in the natural. But I do not believe any of those people replace God and his wisdom and what he sees and what he knows. Because sometimes a medical doctor will diagnose you with something that's spiritual. That's actually a root of spiritual Sometimes counselors are not seeking God for what's best for you, what you need to know, what you need to hear, right? They're, they're, they're counseling you based on a worldview, not a biblical view. They're not coming to you with a, from a place of, listen, but God has plans for you. And that's why you're going through all, all of this because your daily walk with Jesus is always unfolding each and every day. He's bringing more freedom. He's unbinding you from chains. He's setting you free from that. He's healing you from this. And all the while, we're learning more about the Good Shepherd himself. 
So that's why we want to go into the secret place. But here's the thing. It doesn't just happen, okay? Uh, going into prayer with God, going into a secret place, um, and, and maybe it's not, you know, let's don't box in the secret place. I do like a quiet place with God. I will not lie to you. I do put on worship. I don't like people bothering me when I'm in that place. Why? Because I'm where I am in the most important place there is in that moment. Nothing else is more important than, than that, okay? Because if I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not only is all going to be done for me, but it's going to be good, better for me as a mother, better for me as a grandmother, better for me as a wife, better for me as a daughter. My kids benefit, my husband benefits, my mom benefits, my dad benefits. Because let me tell you what, keep me away from Jesus and I'll go back to the old Shelly in a heartbeat. Right? So we want to cultivate the discipline and the surrender that is required to follow Jesus. So I don't want you guys beating up yourself, but I also don't want to give room for excuses. Um, and I say that in the most loving way. Um, let's just ask God, how can I creatively... For some of us who need need a creative answer. And then others of us really need to go, actually, I, I do have time. I'm just not making time. Or I'm allowing everything else to intervene. I'll give you an example that I follow. Um, now, I will say I'm very... I am very guarded when it comes to my prayer time and closet time. That is not to say that I haven't messed up, that I haven't missed it, that I haven't been allowed distractions. Okay, so I'm not coming to you as somebody who does this perfectly. But this is my stand, the standard I try to live by. I do not take anybody, any phone calls mo most of the time. And I do not take any appointments, even in the ministry, before 10 a.m. That is my rule. Why? And I've had people ask me, well, can't you be here at night? No. Why? Because I have time carved out. I have some health issues. So there, there's, a, there's a set of time that I get up. I get up. I spend my time with the Lord. And then I allow myself to get ready. I have time where I can get ready to come to work, right? So I take nothing, even on a weekend, I don't, I don't mess, I don't, I don't let anything in until 10 a.m. Now, in my life when I was in business, right? In my life when I was in business, um, before I had some health challenges, I actually got up earlier. It was, it was something that was easy for me. It's not that easy for me anymore. Okay, so I've had to make adjustments in my life because of circumstances. Some of you have circumstances you need to make adjustments for. Just like we talked about last night, for some of you, it's noontime, right? But you have to make up your mind to put it into practice. And you have to become consistent with it. Because let me tell you, anything without consistency will not last. Your Bible reading will not last. Your prayer time won't last. Okay, so you have to employ the discipline of the time with the Lord. I hope this is making sense. It's not about, man, I'm such a loser because I haven't been doing this. No, no. I think God wants to touch on something and we go, okay, let's embrace the teaching of the Lord. Let's embrace that I need to do this better. Let's embrace that this is how, this is how. I learn his way with me. This is where I learn about the love of Jesus. This is where all things that are holy and godly come to me. This is where my family will flourish. This is where my marriage will flourish. This is where um, my life in Jesus begins and ends, right? I'm, we're not coming into this place to always get from God. We're coming into this place to just be with God. Big difference, right? Do we bring our request to the Lord? Of course, I do every day. I also lift up many of you before the Lord every day by name. 
Would you, Lord, would you help me help her in this area? Is there something I'm missing here that I could, I could say or I could do or a scripture I could point her to? I'm always doing those kind of things. But I'm having to learn, just like you guys are, that most important of all, he just wants to be with us, to be with us. Just like your kids don't always want something from you, they just like to be with you. You ever notice how your kids can be playing in the room and you're not really talking to them, but they're content. Why? Because you're in the room. It's kind of the same way when our father's in the room, right? He's trying to teach us how to be content in his presence, right? In the place of his presence is where he shines a light on things in our heart that needs to change. There's no timeline Let's talk about timelines. Uh, there is no magic number of I must spend an hour with God. I must spend three, four, five, six hours. I will tell you this. I have read many accounts of mighty people used by God who did spend hours with God. They had different circumstances. What can I tell you? Their walk was unique to themselves. You can't compare your walk with mine, and I can't compare my walk with yours. I'll tell you this. I am required to have a lot of time with the Lord. Why? Because I would have nothing to bring to you without it. There's something that you will miss if I don't spend my time with the Lord. Because I'm going to miss it if I don't spend my time with the Lord. Right? But there have been times that I've stepped into my closet, put on some worship music, just to get my, just to let everything, you know, all the stress of the world go. Just to let the Lord bathe me in his presence. And all of a sudden I've heard him say, go do this. And it was a five minute session. And I'm like, well, that's it, Lord? Well, when he tells you to do something, you get up and go do it. So our time was done for that day. So you see, you can't, we're not into methods. We're not into time frames or timelines, things like that, okay? But we do, the, the, the main point of this today is to go, okay, let's solve the issue. Let's, let's purpose to fight for our time with the Lord because he is, he is our first love. Remember, everybody else has to get in line behind him. If we have allowed everybody else ahead of him, then in all honesty, I have to be truthful with you and say then you have created idols because you've made everybody else more important than him. And that is sin. Okay, so that is the reality. That is the reality. That's another reason we want to purpose to get our time with the Lord in place and space. So how does that look for you? I've known people to go sit in their car while they're at work, go sit in their car uh, and spend the hour in their car eating, listening to sermons, praying. That's great. That is no less a prayer closet of the secret place than if I'm in my little closet with the door shut. That is just as a powerful of a place as, as what I'm doing. And then you have to know that God always honors the sacred space, no matter what it looks like or how you do it. When God knows that you've purposed your heart to meet with him, he always honors that. Always. There are some times... In certain seasons where I've gone into my closet with no words at all, because all I knew to do was cry. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit hears the groanings of our heart. He, he prays for us with groanings. He hears, he hears the sorrow when it's making noise. It's interesting. I can hear the words. He hears the sorrow when it's singing. He hears the sorrow singing in the heart. He hears the tears from the trauma that haven't been cried yet. Some people have trouble crying after trauma. Some people have put up such a hard wall that it takes a while for the Holy Spirit to soften the hard heart and to begin to work with us in certain areas, right? Because we've created a protective a mechanism for us so we don't get hurt again. We all need a safe place. And while I love that our rooms are safe, you are safer still when you are sitting with the Lord. Safer than you'll ever be in my building. Safer than you'll ever be with me or Jan or Debbie. Safer than you're ever, you'll ever be 
is still yet in the presence of the Lord all by yourself. And then you have to have grace for yourself when you mess it up or miss it or forget it, right? But I want you to start treating it as a job, but a job you love, a job you go, you don't have to clock in and punch in, right? But I want you to know that when you spend time with the Lord, just like your secular job or, or whatever kind of job it is, there is a payday that comes. The payday may not be in money, but the payday is in nearness to Jesus. When the Bible says we are to hide the word in our heart, that means we have to break open the book, right? If we're going to hide the word in our heart, then I've got to read it over and over and over. It took me years to memorize. I'm not a, a scripture memory person. That's not something I do on a regular basis. God with me, this is what he does. He works the scripture out of me by circumstance in my life. And it becomes a scripture that I will never, ever forget again. Right? So though, though that's the moments in those valley seasons where I'm running to the closet, sometimes, you know, it's for a few minutes, several times a day, and I'm just, Lord, this right here is bothering me. Could you help me with it? Could you, could you just get the monkey off my back? I've said that so many times in my closet. Lord, I feel like there's a monkey on my back somewhere. Where's the burden I don't see? Talk to me about this. And then you just have this honest dialogue and, and let him, he may answer right then, and then he may answer you throughout the day. He may answer you when you open your Bible. He may answer you through a friend. He may answer you through a song, right? But at least I know when he answers because I was, I was already petitioning for it. So how are you going to implement the time with the Lord? Where can you put it on, schedule it on your calendar? It's kind of like what I tell you writers. You will never write until you purpose to write, right? I had to make room for writing. Of course, I write prophetically. I write when God writes it. You know what that means? That means whatever I'm doing at that moment has to stop. That includes dinner at my house. My kids had to learn. Oh, my gosh, I'm getting a new song. I'll be back. I turn off the stove, and their dinner was a little late. But, you know, we all survived, and it was okay. Some things that we think are so critically important, important are actually not that important. They will get done, and everybody's going to be okay. Right? So how can you today... No more excuses. I'm not going to make room for excuses. I'm going to say, have grace with yourself. We're not going to look at the past and condemn ourselves, but we're going to go, okay, let's rectify this now. Let's do the first thing first, right? How do I get there? And if you don't know how to do it, then, and you need to come in and see me, then you come in and see me and we'll work out a plan. We'll work out a plan for you to try and we'll do some trial and error till we'll see what works. But I'm not, I'm really not willing to let you me or you or any of us not receive all that Jesus wants to give us, right? So God, I just want to pray today, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, we become diligent disciples of yours where we fight with the sword, where we fight to get into the prayer closet, God, where we refuse to let distractions come, where we recognize distractions when they walk in the door, Lord, I thank you that there is not, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And that when I fall off the wagon, I just have to get back up and try again. That that's, that's what repentance is, right? I'm sorry, Lord. I just couldn't do it today for whatever reason. And, and, and Lord, help me do it. Help me tomorrow. And then, Lord, I'm asking you for, for really crystal clear blueprints, uh, uh, even maybe if they, they need some of my checklist girls, maybe you need to get planners, right? You like checklists. You like make lists to check off your list. I don't really like checklists when it comes to the Lord, but you know, he will use the way we're wired. He will use our personality, the way we like to do things. And if you need to make a list, make a list. I was just watching a movie this week where, where a man, because he came from foster homes and every, uh, maybe 20-something foster homes, and because of the trauma in his life and the way he was never able to, to be real settled, 
he had a woman in one of the Christian homes that said, listen, because everything overwhelms you and you need to do one thing at a time, why don't you make you a list? And that man lived by a godly list. It, it was something that he needed to do to help him because he had um, some anxieties and some fears and things from his past. So if you need to make you a list, make you a list. And when you make your calendar, and for some of you, if it says from 12 to 1, this is my quiet time, it needs to be posted in your kitchen on your bathroom mirror so hubby or whoever else in your house sees it so everybody knows. And you can have that family meeting. This is what's now going to be implemented in my life. I need you to know how important it is. I need you to interrupt me with emergencies only. And I'm going to include you as much as I can in it. Right? So, Lord, I'm asking you to relieve all burdens in Jesus' name. All confusion in Jesus' name. Um any spirit that would come and lie to them and say, there's no time, there's no way you're going to accomplish this, you can't be successful, the devil is a liar in Jesus' name. Lord, let your, let your burden be easy. Your yoke is light, God. Let them only have the burden of the Lord because you carry the burden, God. You carry our burdens. So, Lord, just one thing at a time. Father, help them just make up their minds to now insert you into the calendar. Insert you into the daily tasks, into the ritual of life, into the to-do list. It's not uh, optional. It's not an optional thing anymore. Let it be decided in their hearts that this is the way in which I must go. This is the way I choose to live being in the presence of God for us, getting, getting my directions for the day, getting my help with my children, getting my help with my family, getting my help with my co-workers, getting my help with my own heart. And Lord, to every distraction and hell that's come up against them, to keep them from Jesus, I say, be gone in Jesus' name. Let there be peace like a river that now ushers you in to the precious, precious, precious presence of God. Perhaps your prayers need to be written on a page for you to focus. That's just as intimate as you speaking it out loud or in your head before the Lord. And if that's the way you need to process with God, that's how I am. Then you go right ahead. Teach them who they are, Father. And how they can uh, cooperate with you in prayer. Cooperate with you in kingdom assignments, Lord. I pray, Father, for a release of all anxiety over it. Of all depression over it. Of all condemnation over it. And I say, none of that's Jesus. Let the love of Jesus come to you now and say, I just want to be with you. It's just that simple. Let me teach you my ways. Let me teach you my, let me show you my heart. Let me show you the plans I have for you, plans for hope in the future, not to harm you. Let me show you the good works that I have really stored up for you. Let me show you, child, the immeasurably more that you, than you can even think or imagine. Let me show you the dreams that you have forgotten because life came with pain and sin, and trauma, and abuse. Let me take you back to the beginning. Let me heal the little girl in you. Let me show you what's right and show you what's wrong. Let me show you who you are. Let me show you what I see in you. Let me show you what I formed in the womb before you were ever born. Let me show you all the days that I wrote down in my book for you before you were one day old. Let me show you. Let me show you why I made you this way and not that way. Let me show you why I made you like you and not like somebody else. Let me show you what a mighty warrior you are through my eyes. Let me unravel the way you see yourself. 
Let me remove the all the, um, I hear the word spoils of war. Sometimes that's positive, but sometimes it's not. All the spoils of war, all the things that people have tried to say you are or are not. Let me show you who I see. And Father, I thank you that you are the perfect shepherd. You are the perfect sin sacrifice for all of us. I thank you, Lord, that you bridged the gap between man and the Father and that by the blood of Jesus, we are redeemed. I thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit after you ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father to live in us, to be, a, we are now your dwelling place. I thank you, Lord, there is security in salvation because of the cross of Christ. I don't have to wonder where I'm going. I thank you, God, that it is not by works that we are saved, lest any man should boast, but it is by faith alone in Christ that we must be born again to be saved. It is a supernatural transaction. Holy Spirit, I ask you for a release of joy over every listener at the possibilities of the kind of prayer table, prayer closet, altar place, whatever they want to call it, the secret place, let's just call it the secret place, that there would be a joy bubbled up in their spirit at the thought of creating a secret place. And God, I am so grateful, so grateful that you don't let us live underneath the priesthood, that you want us to step into the co-heir anointing that you have died to give us. I ask you, God, to begin to speak secrets to each heart. Maybe it's things they've never told anybody and only, only you know about. You did that once last night, and I'm so grateful for that, Lord. That sometimes you answer the quiet questions of our heart that we don't even say out loud. But you want us to be sure and understand that you hear and you see. And you're, you're on the job at all times. God, we bless you. You are, you are lovely and wonderful and majestic and holy and good. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, you guys. Until next week, see you then. We hope today's episode has blessed you and encouraged you to pursue Christ passionately. To join us again for more encouragement, equipping, and empowering, subscribe to the 320 Podcast. We would also like to invite you to enjoy our round the clock radio station, Royalty for Real Radio for Women, at royaltyforreal.com. That's royalty, the number four, real.com.